Fourth Mansions, in which there are three chapters. Chapter 1 treats of the difference between sweetness or tenderness in prayer and consolations, and tells of the happiness which the author gained from learning how different thought is from understanding. This chapter is very profitable for those who suffer greatly from distractions during prayer. Before I begin to speak of the fourth mansions, it is most necessary that I should do what I have already done, namely, commend myself to the Holy Spirit, and beg Him from this point onward to speak for me, so that you may understand what I shall say about the mansions still to be treated. For we now begin to touch the supernatural, and this is most difficult to explain unless His Majesty takes it in hand, as He did when I described as much as I understood of the subject about fourteen years ago. Although I think I have now a little more light upon these favors which the Lord grants to some souls, it is a different thing to know how to explain them. May His Majesty undertake this, if there is any advantage to be gained from its being done, but not otherwise. As these mansions are now getting near to the place where the King dwells, they are of great beauty, and there are such exquisite things to be seen and appreciated in them that the understanding is incapable of describing them in any way accurately without being completely obscure to those devoid of experience. But any experienced person will understand quite well, especially if his experience has been considerable. It seems that, in order to reach these mansions, one must have lived for a long time in the others. As a rule, one must have been in those which we have just described, but there is no infallible rule about it, as you must often have heard, for the Lord gives when He wills, and as He wills, and to whom He wills, and as the gifts are His own, this is doing no injustice to anyone. Into these mansions poisonous creatures seldom enter, and if they do, they prove quite harmless. In fact, they do the soul good. I think in this state of prayer it is much better for them to enter and make war upon the soul, for, if it had no temptations, the devil might mislead it with regard to the consolations which God gives, and do much more harm than he can when it is being tempted. The soul, too, would not gain so much, for it would be deprived of all occasions of merit, and be living in a state of permanent absorption." When a soul is continuously in a condition of this kind, I do not consider it at all safe, nor do I think it possible for the Spirit of the Lord to remain in a soul continuously in this way during our life of exile. Returning to what I was saying I would describe here, namely, the difference between sweetness in prayer and spiritual consolations, it seems to me that we may describe as sweetness what we get from our meditations and from petitions made to our Lord. This proceeds from our own nature, though, of course, God plays a part in the process, and in everything I say you must understand this, for we can do nothing without Him. This spiritual sweetness arises from the actual virtuous work which we perform and we think we have acquired it by our labors. We are quite right to feel satisfaction at having worked in such a way, but when we come to think of it, the same satisfaction can be derived from numerous things that may happen to us here on earth. When, for example, a person suddenly acquires some valuable property, or equally suddenly meets a person whom he dearly loves, or brings some important piece of business or some other weighty matter to a successful conclusion so that everyone speaks well of him, or when a woman has been told that her husband or brother or son is dead and he comes back to her alive. I have seen people shed tears over some great joy. Sometimes, in fact, I have done so myself. It seems to me that the feelings which come to us from divine things are as purely natural as these, except that their source is nobler, although these worldly joys are in no way bad. 
To put it briefly, worldly joys have their source in our own nature and end in God, whereas spiritual consolations have their source in God, but we experience them in a natural way and enjoy them as much as we enjoy those I have already mentioned, and indeed much more. O oh, Jesus, how I wish I could make myself clear about this, for I think I can see a very marked difference between these two things, and yet I am not clever enough to make my meaning plain. May the Lord explain it for me. I have just remembered a verse which we say at the end of the last psalm at prime. The last words of the verse are, Cum dilitaste cor meum. To anyone who has much experience, this will suffice to explain the difference between the two, though to anyone who has not, further explanation is necessary. The spiritual sweetness which has been described does not enlarge the heart. As a rule, it seems to oppress it somewhat. The soul experiences a great happiness when it realizes what it is doing for God's sake, but it sheds a few bitter tears which seem in some way to be the result of passion. I know little about these passions of the soul. If I knew more, perhaps I could make the thing clear and explain what proceeds from sensuality and what from our own nature. But I am very stupid. I could explain this state if only I could understand my own experience of it. Knowledge and learning are a great help in everything. My own experience of this state, I mean of these favors and this sweetness in meditation, was that if I began to weep over the passion, I could not stop until I had a splitting headache, and the same thing happened when I wept for my sins. This was a great grace granted me by our Lord, and I will not for the moment examine each of these favors and decide which is the better of the two. I wish, however, that I could explain the difference between them. In the state I am now describing, the tears and longings sometimes arise partly from our nature and from the state of preparedness we are in, but nevertheless, as I have said, they eventually lead one to God. And this is an experience to be greatly prized, provided the soul be humble and can understand that it does not make it any the more virtuous, for it is impossible to be sure that these feelings are effects of love, and even so, they are a gift of God. Most of the souls which dwell in the mansions already described are familiar with these feelings of devotion, for they labor with the understanding almost continuously and make use of it in their meditations. They are right to do this because nothing more has been given them. They would do well, however, to spend short periods in making various acts and in praising God and rejoicing in His goodness and in His being who He is and in desiring His honor and glory. They should do this as well as they can, for it goes a long way towards awakening the will. But when the Lord gives them this other grace, let them be very careful not to reject it for the sake of finishing their customary meditation. As I have written about this at great length elsewhere, I will not repeat it here. I only want you to be warned that, if you would progress a long way on this road and ascend to the mansions of your desire, the important thing is not to think much, but to love much. Do then whatever most arouses you to love. Perhaps we do not know what love is. It would not surprise me a great deal to learn this, for love consists not in the extent of our happiness, but in the firmness of our determination to try to please God in everything, and to endeavor in all possible ways not to offend Him, and to pray Him ever to advance the honor and glory of His Son and the growth of the Catholic Church. Those are the signs of love. Do not imagine that the important thing is never to be thinking of anything else, and that if your mind becomes slightly distracted, all is lost. I have sometimes been terribly oppressed by this turmoil of thoughts, and it is only just over four years ago that I came to understand by experience that thought, or to put it more clearly, imagination, is not the same thing as understanding. I asked a learned man about this, and he said I was right, which gave me no small satisfaction. For, 
As the understanding is one of the faculties of the soul, I found it very hard to see why it was sometimes so timid, whereas thoughts, as a rule, fly so fast that only God can restrain them, which he does by uniting us in such a way that we seem, in some sense, to be loosed from this body. It exasperated me to see the faculties of the soul, as I thought, occupied with God and recollected in him, and the thought, on the other hand, confused and excited. O Lord, do thou remember how much we have to suffer on this road through lack of knowledge. The worst of it is that, as we do not realize we need to know more when we think about thee, we cannot ask those who know. Indeed, we have not even any idea what there is for us to ask them. So we suffer terrible trials because we do not understand ourselves, and we worry over what is not bad at all, but good, and think it very wrong. Hence proceed the afflictions of many people who practice prayer, and their complaints of interior trials, especially if they are unlearned people, so that they become melancholy, and their health declines, and they even abandon prayer altogether, because they fail to realize that there is an interior world close at hand." Just as we cannot stop the movement of the heavens, revolving as they do with such speed, so we cannot restrain our thought. And then we send all the faculties of the soul after it, thinking we are lost and have misused the time that we are spending in the presence of God. Yet the soul may perhaps be wholly united with him in the mansions very near his presence, while thought remains in the outskirts of the castle, suffering the assaults of a thousand wild and venomous creatures, and from this suffering winning merit. So this must not upset us, and we must not abandon the struggle, as the devil tries to make us do. Most of these trials and times of unrest come from the fact that we do not understand ourselves. As I write this, the noises in my head are so loud that I am beginning to wonder what is going on in it. As I said at the outset, they have been making it almost impossible for me to obey those who commanded me to write. My head sounds just as if it were full of brimming rivers, and then as if all the water in those rivers came suddenly rushing downward, and a host of little birds seem to be whistling, not in the ears, but in the upper part of the head, where the higher part of the soul is said to be. I have held this view for a long time, for the spirit seems to move upward with great velocity. Please, God, I may remember to explain the cause of this when I am writing of the later mansions. Here it does not fit in well. I should not be surprised to know that the Lord has been pleased to send me this trouble in my head so that I may understand it better, for all this physical turmoil is no hindrance either to my prayer or to what I am saying now, but the tranquility and love in my soul are quite unaffected, and so are its desires and clearness of mind. But if the higher part of the soul is in the upper part of the head, how is it that it experiences no disturbance? That I do not know, but I do know that what I say is true. I suffer when my prayer is not accompanied by suspension of the faculties, but when the faculties are suspended, I feel no pain until the suspension is over. It would be a terrible thing if this obstacle forced me to give up praying altogether. It is not good for us to be disturbed by our thoughts or to worry about them in the slightest, for if we do not worry, and if the devil is responsible for them, they will cease, and if they proceed, as they do, from the weakness which we inherit from the sin of Adam and from many other weaknesses, let us have patience and bear everything for the love of God. Similarly, we are obliged to eat and sleep, and we cannot escape from these obligations, though they are a great burden to us. Let us recognize our weakness in these respects, and desire to go where nobody will despise us. I sometimes recall words I have heard, spoken by the bride in the canticles, and really I believe there is no point in our lives at which they can more properly be used, for I do not think that all the scorn and all the trials which we may have to suffer in this life can equal those interior battles. Any unrest and any strife can be borne, as I have already said, if we find peace where we live. 
But if we would rest from the thousand trials which afflict us in the world, and the Lord is pleased to prepare such rest for us, and yet the cause of the trouble is in ourselves, the result cannot but be very painful, indeed almost unbearable. For this cause, Lord, do thou take us to a place where these weaknesses, which sometimes seem to be making sport of the soul, do not cause us to be despised. Even in this life the Lord will free the soul from this, when it has reached the last mansion, as, if it please God, we shall explain. These weaknesses will not give everyone so much trouble, or assail everyone as violently, as for many years they troubled and assailed me. For I was a wicked person, and it seemed as though I were trying to take vengeance on myself. As it has been such a troublesome thing for me, it may perhaps be so for you as well, so I am just going to describe it, first in one way, and then in another, hoping that I may succeed in making you realize how necessary it is, so that you may not grow restless and distressed. The clacking old mill must keep on going round, and we must grind our own flour. Neither the will nor the understanding must cease working." This trouble will sometimes be worse, and sometimes better, according to our health and according to the times and seasons. The poor soul may not be to blame for this, but it must suffer none the less, for, as we shall commit other faults, it is only right that we should have patience. And as we are so ignorant that what we read and are advised, namely that we should take no account of these thoughts, is not sufficient to teach us, it does not seem to me a waste of time if I go into it farther and offer you some consolation about it, though this will be of little help to you until the Lord is pleased to give us light. But it is necessary, and His Majesty's will, that we should take proper measures and learn to understand ourselves and not blame our souls for what is the work of our weak imagination and our nature and the devil.